So this is going to be an unusual Papers We Love talk. I'm going to discuss a bunch of different papers in relatively light detail, but with rich historical context. I will post a transcript and mini site for this talk with links to all the papers and many others that serve as supporting material. So last year, I gave a talk at Strange Loop where I said everyone is programming wrong. This, this upset some people, and I thought I'd make a more modest claim today. Everyone is doing mathematics wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll need some background to make sense of what follows. And I'm going to start with a very easy question. What is mathematics, and where does it come from? Famously, no one has ever struggled with this one. So there are many lenses for this question. I'm going to supply one to serve for the duration of this talk. I, I think we both discover and invent mathematics as we go, and that part of what we discover is the nature of our own evolved capabilities. And we'll start with geometry, which is, in my opinion, the basis for everything else we have. OK, so from this little guy here, uh, upper right quadrant for you, uh, we have a half billion year old bug-like Cambrian swimmer. And then we have bug-eating early mammals. And then we have a bug-eating prosimian. I mean, giving our family tree, it's no surprise that our software is full of bugs. But we have something else in common, which is that we all survive by moving through 3D space. And to move through space, you need to be able to plan based on what you're sensing, which requires you to emulate the world to make predictions about future states. So this is Simone Biles, one of the greatest gymnasts ever to compete. She's showing truly elite human spatial and thus geometric ability. And my contention is that everything we do in technical mathematics, the kind we use in engineering and most physics, comes from the same evolved capacities that allow her to plan and execute that elaborate series of translations and rotations. And our ability to turn those physical gifts inward is what has given us sculpture and perspective drawing, as well as mathematical geometry. And our ability to reason about objects in space led naturally to our number sense. Now, many animals have been shown to count objects and work with sequences, and there seems to be a natural development of pattern matching and interacting with objects in the world. Most of you know that pigeons and rats can learn to press a lever a certain number of times to get a treat. What you might be more surprised to learn is that red forest ants can count to around 20 and communicate those quantities to other ants. And some animals can apply short-term memory to sequences better than most humans. This chimp is memorizing these numerical sequences and tapping them out after they're occluded. This is something at which the average chimp outperforms the average human. This brings us to algebra. So while number sex exists in some extent to, in most animals, in geometric sense probably exists in all complex life forms, algebra is more specifically human. It has biological roots in language and deliberation. So this is the first paper I'll recommend today even though it has nothing to do with computer science or mathematics. It's an especially good follow-up to the research on bias that you might have seen from Kahneman and Tversky and uh, things like thinking fast and slow. Their claim, and I, I think they're right, is that as a group living species, our reason abilities rose in the context of deliberation, which gave rise to persuasion and the skeptical evaluation of claims. And this arms race between these facilities reified cause and effect reasoning into a conscious, reflective, and linguistic process. Formal logic and symbolic fluency seem to be downstream of this. And once we translated the ability to communicate via streams of words and symbols, that is to say into art and writing, we were able to develop notation, at which point we moved from biology to culture in our story here today. And one of the most successful cultural artifacts of all time is maths notation. So we might ask, what's it for? It's both for communication and for thinking. You know, the simplicity and clarity of a good notation not only allows us to serialize our understanding and transmit it to other human beings, it also becomes an engine for our own thinking. In the context of physics and engineering, we really want that notation to speak as directly as possible to our inner gymnast so that we can bring our deepest evolved powers to bear on whatever problem we're solving. As Bertrand Russell puts it here, a good notation can be a teacher unto itself. You bounce your ideas off a of formalism that guides you to a deeper understanding. That said, if he were alive today, I think he'd go further and champion machine-readable notation. That is to say, programming languages. Anybody here who has both worked with an through an algebraic problem on paper and also used an interactive programming system, like, for example, Mathematica, will be able to attest to the power of the latter for improving understanding. So I'm going to look at mathematics, uh, mathematical notation through a programming language lens throughout the day. And this is an eccentric way of doing this. And I'm going to anachronistically project back ideas that didn't exist at the times these things were invented. Uh, and I, I'm doing this both because this is a, an audience of mostly programmers with varying levels of mathematical ability, but also because I think we do need to apply what we've learned from programming languages in the 20th century. So this notation, it's really, it's, it's one of our best tools for thought. And I don't have time to make the full argument for this and for the need to move to machine-readable uh, notations here today, but I will recommend strongly this paper by Sussman and Wisdom which discusses the work they did creating a scheme-based curriculum for classical mechanics. If you prefer it in talk, uh, talk form, check out Sussman's Programming for the Expression of Ideas, and Sam Ritchie's talks about Emmy, a closure port of Sussman's system, which I hope you all saw at his talk earlier today at this conference. So what do we really want 
for this kind of notation? Well, we want a small number of orthogonal primitives. It's going to be purely functional because mathematics is. It'll have recursive definitions, and it'll be lightly object-oriented. And I mean that in the sense that it will have generic dispatch of some set of operations over a family of mathematical objects. So let's build a protocol for arithmetic in the same order our cultural ancestors did, starting with the natural numbers, the non-negative integers. Now, I say non-negative, but a fun fact about the natural numbers is that there's still to this day no agreement as to whether they include zero. Uh, <laughs> these are the numbers we use in informal or folk mathematics, the ones we share with those forest ants we saw earlier. They're very tangible and intuitive. You can do the first three operations on this slide with any kind of object in the, in the natural world. Division's a bit weird, right? You either have to accept that the operation returns a tuple of quotient and remainder, which initially feels like a type error, or you need to invent fractions, at which point you have rational numbers, but only the positive ones. So this would be whole numbers and vulgar fractions, right? Now these are usually uh, presented after the integers for set theoretical reasons, but we're working today in the order in which these are normally discovered, rather than the order in which they're taught. So then we have a protocol that looks like this, right? We've got these four operations, we've got these types. Now the first people we see using this protocol are in ancient Mesopotamia. These objects you see here are almost 6,000 years old. The thing on the top is called a bulla, which is a kind of spherical clay envelope, and the smaller things below are stylized representations of trade goods. Let's say the middle row are croissant tokens, yeah? So I might put three of them in a bulla and then seal it with an amazing cryptographically secure cylinder seal of people walking to the left, as you see here. <laughs> and then later you could drop by my bakery and collect your pastries. So this is tangible computing in an extreme sense, right? <laughs> so over time, they switched to using tokens to make impressions in clay tablets. So you could just push the goat token down five times and say, well, that's five goats. And then they moved to drawing you know, directly on the clay and making tally marks, which gets a little better. Fun things to note about this piece of history. Sculpture preceded writing. Our first forms of writing were about numbers. And accounting and credit long precede the invention of money. Anyway, these were very intelligent people. So they quickly invented a more abstract numerical notation that looked like this. Now it's base 60, unlike our base 10 numbers, but they had a true place value system like we do, not like Roman numerals. And 60 is actually a boss way to do this because it has all these factors. So if you're living in a world where you're doing everything with fractions, as they were, it's amazing to be able to factor all of your numbers. They even did their, uh, their division by multiplication of fractions. So instead of dividing something by two, they would multiply it by one half, or as, as we put it these days, multiplication by reciprocals. And to make that fast, they had big pre-computed tablets of reciprocals, squares, cubes, uh, roots, and everything else, which we see engineers doing in our culture as late as the 20th century, right up until there were computers. So you might ask, what did they get up to with all these numbers? So I call this tablet a paper I love, but it's actually a 4,000-year-old homework assignment. <laughs> right? So what's this person doing, this young scribe? They're solving a problem of area using, using Pythagoras' theorem, which you'll note is named after someone born 1,500 years later. <laughs> and the cuneiform writing in the middle shows the square root of two to six decimal places. They were iteratively approximating irrational numbers in Babylon, which is why God struck them down, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what were they doing? Like They developed these tools for surveying initially because they were calculating the areas of parcels and fields, which as, as an agrarian people you'd expect. And they were doing a lot of astronomy because they, ha they had a moon-based calendar, the way everybody does, a lunar calendar, and they needed to square it with the solar one so they knew when to plant for the seasons and all that. But they went way past what was reasonable for this purpose. Everything was surplus to requirements. It's pretty clear to me, reading these old tablets, that the scribal class was composed of the same kind of curious weirdos who invent everything, everywhere, in every culture. They solved quadratic and cubic equations. They worked with exponential growth and interest rates. They even came up with a Fourier analysis to compute the ephemeris so they could pick out where the plants would be in the future. This is approximately on par with European mathematics 3,500 years later. So you might wonder, why weren't we on the moon by like a thousand BCE, right? <laughs> you know, they were prosperous and they were so close to inventing modern technical mathematics. To put it in perspective, we're only about 600 years after European mathematics reached the same point. And the answer, as it so often is, yeah. So their agricultural technology that allowed them to feed their big cities and develop their sophisticated culture was unsustainable. The soil grew depleted and salty over time, reducing crop yields. And then there was an interval of rapid and severe climate change that led to famine and war. Any resemblance to the current era is, I'm sure, entirely coincidental and no cause for alarm. <laughs> anyway, after around 1550 BCE, there's a dramatic fall off of mathematical tablets. All you get are things like this king telling that king that he's going to go kill him if he doesn't give him enough whatever. 
And we don't see very much mathematical progress for about a thousand years. This was a long period of relative stagnation. The, good, the highlights I can give is that the Greeks invented basic formal proofs around 600 BCE, and a couple of people came up with good ways to approximate the area under a curve, but otherwise, not much was happening. And one of the reasons for all of this stagnation was that the Greeks really hated irrational numbers. <laughs> Although Babylonians and Egyptians were okay with approximating the square root of two, the Greeks thought that they were an abomination. If contemporary accounts were to be believed, people were murdered in ancient Greece for talking about these numbers, which violated closely held philosophical ideas. Ultimately, they wanted maths to be like the counting with tokens thing that we saw earlier, which I contend held them back for quite some time. So for the next thousand or so years after that, various cultures took turns shepherding the torch of the surviving wisdom of the ancients. The Greeks, the Persians, the Indian mathematicians, the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, Brahmagupta and al khwarizmi were as important to what we have today as Descartes and Gauss. But in the interest of time, we're just going to skip forward to Italy in the 1500s. So <laughs> by that time, our protocol has grown to include a few more types, right? We have most of the numeric types that we recognize, but we still have the same four basic methods over it. And uh, some of these numbers are a bit weird, like the irrationals are odd, but if you squint at them long enough, you can kind of pretend they're at least the same kind of thing as the natural numbers. Because we're interested in geometry, let's just take a quick look at these numbers through a spatial or a geometric lens, right? So spatially, this number line is a bit strange, right? We don't, we're not taught that it's weird, but it is weird, because we have an infinite line, but somehow it also has an end at zero. And it's a singularity beneath which subtraction fails. So, you know, to, to really get somewhere, you need negative numbers. And uh, as you might imagine, <laughs> people hated negative numbers too. They really despise them. Uh, and this is mainly because it's not intuitively obvious that you can have minus three goats, right? It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> so Diophantus said any negative solution to an equation was automatically false. Leibniz hated them, and they didn't start to be widely used until the mid-19th century, which is kind of crazy from our modern perspective. Now, I think they're actually more radical than the irrationals because they changed the spatial interpretation of the number line in a very important way. So we now have the origin in the middle of the line and an infinite extent to either side. It's symmetrical. So we can think of addition and subtraction as translation in a point in this infinite space. And more interestingly, we can interpret the sign flip we get with multiplication by minus one as a rotation around the origin by 180 degrees. Some of the mathematicians here are saying it could also be a reflection. And that's true. But today, we're going to pretend it's only a rotation. <laughs> So by, so by adding a new kind of number, we get a new kind of space, actually, that allows both translation and a limited form of rotation. And the next big discovery, which many of you have already guessed, was complex numbers. So in the 1500s, Raphael Bombelli was trying to deal with an equation of this form. And the solution that he had gotten from Cardano for this kind of thing was this, this algorithm that you see here in both maths code and also closure code. And you can see the problem right away. There's a boundary condition where p cubed is greater than q squared, after which one needs to take the square root of a negative number, and it returns none, right? So it's no good. But Bombelli graphed the co two components that he was trying to compare here and visually confirmed that they converge. And he was primarily an engineer, so he did what any engineer would do. He clutched it. Yeah. So he used a placeholder. And this placeholder had a special behavior in these situations. And he got this from Cardano, who had invented it but said it was completely useless. And he then wrote a book. <laughs> Bombelli then wrote a book about how to solve these problems, right? And, and he, the textual description you see here is from that book, except the part with I in it was actually retrofitted in the edition that I screen capped. And although I've read these books, I'm not recommending any from this period because they predate anything like modern notation. And the expedition all looks like this, walls of text with funny drawings. But his method worked, which did not stop, as you can imagine, everyone from sincerely hating it. And <laughs> one of the reasons they hated it, which is hinted at at the bottom there, is it seemed to violate the rules of, of multiplication. It just didn't make sense. And it also looks arbitrary and magical, because they were still under the influence of the Greeks in their perspective on numbers. Now, all of you already know that I stands for imaginar imaginary, but to get a sense of the vibe, Descartes coined the term imaginary number as an insult to the very idea that such a thing could exist. Right? This is how people felt about these numbers. But over the next 250 years, because they simplified calculations involving trig, they gained ground. And by the early 1800s, Argand and Gauss and Vessel all independently figured out that they're special geometric numbers that encode rotations in a 2D plane, which in fairness was a concept that did not exist in Bombelli's time. So we can forgive him for not noticing. Uh, some find this easier, uh, easier to see if they look at it like this, right? This illustration shows that with each exponentiation, I rotates by 90 degrees. And notice how this feels kind of relative to what we saw earlier with the number line where sine flips, sine flips cause rotations. Now that we have two, we're kind of able to cut that in half, and there's more going on that I can't explain to a general audience in the time I have. 
But in my opinion, the move to complex numbers was the biggest jump in, in the history of maths up to that point to having real geometric objects, things that can represent the kind of world that we perceive. And uh, another important fact about this is that once you get to them, you can't really keep pretending that these are numbers in the same sense as you know, the number of goats. We're, we're somewhere else now. We have escaped the uh, naturalistic idea of numbers altogether. And I think this is inevitable. I think without it, the gymnast part of our brains would never have a chance. So we're caught up to the mid-1800s. They were what you might call electrifying times, right? So the study of what we now call electromagnetism was heating up, and commercial applications were becoming very important. The internet boom of the time was the telegraph. Right. It came into commercial use by 1840. Submarine cables were laid by 1850. How's that for progress? How's that for building? Right. So this allowed rapid communication between continents for the first time. To give you some sense of what that meant, it used to take two and a half months for a piece of mail to get from London to Sydney. This chart shows you various ones, but we're not going to linger on it because it's not the main point of this. So this period is where electrical engineering began. It was in the context of a different kind of information technology, the information of telegraphy. Right? And our computers descend directly from the telegraph and telephone. Claude Shannon's master's thesis, which is written only about 80 years later, laid the blueprint for our digital computers by applying Boolean algebra to analog relays in the telephone system. And the people who were working on this stuff at the time were sort of mathephysicists, right? Because they, they hadn't divided into two disciplines at this stage. All mathematicians were physicists and vice versa, at least close to that. And the big problem they faced was coming up with a system for calculations involving 3D space, including rotations. And this was especially important for representing the ideas contained in Maxwell's equations, which we will look at now. So this block that you see on the left there, that's what Maxwell actually wrote down. And it's a lot. You know, there's a lot of stuff there. And the stuff on the right, which is much more concise and actually much more clear if you happen to have learned how to read this particular notation, was created by uh, somebody called Gibbs and another person called Heaviside, one of them in the US, one of them in the UK. And it's the system that's taught today. And even if you can't read it, you can recognize how much more concise it is. And that it contains basically the same mathematical information means we're winning, right? We're, we're able to communicate more in less space. But the notational system that I prefer and that I'm kind of hinting at today captures the same relationship like this. So <laughs> this, this is actually even more terse, but it does contain all of the relevant information. I cannot explain how in the time I have today. But, <laughs> but I will link to an explanation with all the details. And for this audience, I want to instead give a very gentle introduction to this notation, which is called geometric algebra. I'm gonna start with these two fellas. So the, the black and white one is Grassmann, and the other is Clifford. Grassmann was a German high school teacher who invented most of vector algebra as a side quest while studying tidal theory in his spare time. This guy was a genius. Unfortunately, his writing was as muddy as his ideas were brilliant, so his work made almost no impact during his lifetime. Wah, wah. <laughs> Clifford was an English mathematician born somewhat later and also an astronomer, and he was one of the few to read and understand Grassmann's work, which he combined with Hamilton's quaternions, and he, he created this system that he called geometric algebra, but that many modern speakers call Clifford algebra in his honor. Unfortunately, he died of tuberculosis at 33. <laughs> so I suspect we'd have standardized on his approach if he'd lived long enough to make the case for it over the following decades. And the, uh, to talk about this system, we'll add a couple more objects and operations to our protocol. So now we have something like this, right? Multiplication has trifurcated. We have three kinds of multiplication. So the dot product, the wedge, pro wedge product, and the geometric product. And then we have vectors, which I'm calling here K vectors for reasons that we will loop back around to in a couple of minutes. So what do we talk about when we talk about vectors? <laughs> They're geometric objects. They're not numbers, like they're definitely not numbers, but they represent a combination of a length and a direction, and we'll often call the length a magnitude, which is fancy Latin for bigness. And we're gonna cover this idea in 2D because that's easier. So we're gonna start with this, right? So here you see these two orthogonal basis vectors. So here we have two arrows, one whose positive extent extends to the right, called E1, and one that extends upward called E2. They're both of unit length, which is to say of magnitude one. Note that they're written as E1 and E2, not as X and Y. Well, that's because we, as programmers, when we see ourselves giving individual names to ordered sequences of similar things, we start to think, maybe this should be an array with indices or something. And in that spirit, we're using these numbered terms. So you can add them together like this, right? Uh, and you can add them, adding them together along with some scalar multiple of each allows you to create any arrow of any length pointing in any angle, right? It's just linear combinations of these basis vectors. And you can also subtract them. And subtraction flips the sign of the subtracted one. And this is actually very similar to what we saw earlier with the positive and negative number line, right? You change the direction of the thing. You learned all this. This is all the same as what you learned in, in uh, vector algebra at school. The dot product, 
also pretty much the same as what you learned at school. So this is a thing that measures the, the co-extent of these two lines through, a, through distance. And if you use unit vectors that if you normalize to a length of one of the two, you get the cosine back out. And then we have this guy, which is the wedge product. Right, so this guy is, for those of you with a lot of linear algebra, it's a generalization of another product that you've already seen called the cross product. And what this guy does is he returns, instead of like the cross product returns a vector, this guy returns a bivector. So the bivector is this thing you see on the right hand side here, which if a vector is a line that goes in a direction for some distance, this is an oriented area. So it's just a higher dimension analog to a vector. And you can see that one arrow points to the tail of the other arrow, and then there's a circle in the middle. The circle represents the direction that you would rotate in order to bring the head of the second arrow to the tail of the latter, right? And we use, the reason I like these so much compared to other formulations is that if used by vectors to provide uh, your representation of torque and angular momentum in the magnetic field, your computations are actually much more concise and make more geometric sense, which we'll cover more in just a second. And then the most important one of these new kinds of multiplication is something called the geometric product, which as you see here is just taking the dot product and adding it to the wedge product. Now that's kind of weird, right? Because one of them is returning a scalar and the other one's returning this funny bivector thing. But we've actually seen this exact same relationship a few minutes ago, and that's in the complex numbers. So it, it turns out that the imaginary number i was actually just the unit bivector all along. And what was once kind of an algebraic ghost turns out to be a consequence of the geometry of space. Now this is another one where I'll have to link to the supporting materials, but man, the algebraic expansion that proves this is extremely beautiful. Now, I'm gonna compare this approach to the approach that we mostly use. Like if you go and take vector algebra class, there are a lot of matrices involved. And to me, the matrix approach kind of treats vectors as tuples with benefits, right? It's still, it's a series of numbers, and you have to pick the numbers apart, and then you put them into these matrices, and then you grind the crank on the side, and you get, you get the answer. But the geometric, intuition that you get from doing that is usually pretty poor and it takes a lot of time and work to get students to understand what these matrices mean. In contrast, using geometric algebra, you can, if you need a specific rotation uh, by an angle here, you do something that looks exactly like what you would do with a complex number and you can also just rotate by another bivector. So simple multiplication. You can say, hey, I've got a line that points this way and I want to take the product of this line and that line and you'll get a rotation, which is kind of amazing. Uh, as we will see later, this, this makes a lot of things way easier. So moving on from there, I will recommend this paper because it can give you the rigorous treatment that you are craving right now that I cannot provide in this short talk. So this is called Imaginary Numbers Are Not Real. It's by Gull, Lazenby, and Duran. These are three physicists who've done loads of work over the last 20 years to popularize GA in their writing. It, it, it's, everything is very accessible, and if you have high school level maths, you can, you can plow through it. So we've been talking about this all in 2D, which has, has this particular uh, set of entities. But one of the great strengths about this approach is that as you go up in dimensions, you keep exactly the same operations and you have uh, sort of equivalent objects. So we're going to just take a quick look at what the 3D case might look like, which is this. So we talked about how a bivector is what happens when you wedge together two vectors, right? Then you get this area. But if you wedge together three of those, you get an oriented volume. So all the same operations work the same way in three dimensions as they worked in two dimensions. You don't have a lot of new stuff to learn. And this is very different from how we normally teach this stuff. Normally, as you go to three dimensions, you learn two or three different uh, pieces of the toolkit that only ever work in three dimensions, like the cross product. But here you just keep doing things the same way you were doing them. And in, it continues to work as you go up. And this is why we call them K vectors. Because really, what you have is not a vector, a bivector, a trivector. What you have is a one vector, two vector, three vector, four vector, however many vector that you need. And this turns out to be super useful in physics. In fact, variations on geometric algebra have been reinvented repeatedly over history because the original notation we had was insufficient. So Pauli and Dirac algebras are just geometric algebras invented by physicists to solve physical problems without even knowing that Clifford's re results had existed. And all of this, this huge zoo of geometric concepts that we use in technical mathematics are all representable inside geometric algebra. So instead of having to learn like, you know, 10 different things to do your, your basic engineering or physics work, you learn one thing and you keep using it. So what we can say about geometric algebra is it kind of combines lines, areas, and volumes. Now there are other things we care about in geometry that are not there, as you can imagine, right? There are no planes, uh, for example, there are no spheres, the things like that. So there have to be extensions. 
And uh, being able to operate in however many dimensions you please is great, but you kind of need to add one more thing to get the full magic of the system. And unfortunately, it is the most subtle and hard to explain thing here. So we're going to get extra, extra hand wavy now. So that's metrics, right? So, so this is in our programming language metaphor. These are, this is a bit like metaprogramming, where you say, I want an algebra, and I want this many dimensions of the al algebra to square to minus one, like bivectors do. But I also want some that square to either one or zero. The more mathematically sophisticated among you will be saying, oh, yeah, so if you need a hyperbolic space, you could have this, and so on. And that's exactly it. You can, you can then represent more different kinds of spaces this way. And once you do that, you can sourcel up uh, a vast variety of the tools that we use for technical mathematics as these little metric uh, versions of geometric algebra. So here are some examples. Now, this is not in any sense a complete list, but these are some very popular tools that you can get in this way. Uh, and I'll, I'll shout out a couple in particular, right? So the um, Minkowski space-time is super cool for doing physics, and a lot of people are using it for that purpose. And if you look at the conformal geometric algebra, the last one on the list, this one is neat because it has as basic objects, things like spheres. And so if you want a circle, you look at the intersection of two spheres and the part where they meet is a circle. And there are situations where that is pretty great. But for me, the one that is most interesting uh, for the things I do day in and day out is projective geometric algebra, which I use a lot for computer graphics applications. And for that, I'm gonna recommend this paper. And I'll say that, that this line of research really kicked off in 2000 in the context of robotics, when people were looking for better ways to, uh, to handle the geometry of the world inside of a, a situated agent. And there was a fellow called Zelig who wrote a really nice paper, I will link to it. And that was followed up by theoretical work by a fellow called Charles Gunn. Uh, but because of the background of this audience, I think the best paper for you, if you're interested in this part, is this one by Doris and Dekenick. Uh, and these same people have many fantastic video presentations on YouTube. You can find great stuff about this that will go in depth. And Dekenic in particular is a tireless advocate who has built a fantastic JavaScript playground for this stuff called Ganja. Uh, but in the meantime, we're gonna do a little bit of ill-advised live coding, right? <laughs> so. Okay, so we have our friend Emacs here and we have a little box. <laughs> You'll notice it's closure code. Sorry for the non-list people. There's a JavaScript version of this I, I will link to as well, which, you know, if you need infix, it has it for you. Uh, so, <laughs> so this is one of those metric things where I'm, I'm declaring this, uh, this certain algebra of these dimensions and, and this metric. And I'm not going to explain what that means at the moment. These are kind of throwaway things that are building that box by knowing how to make uh, vertices and edges. We got some starter state for a couple of things. And then this, this function here, is uh, the entire physics engine. And, and I wanna make clear that what I'm about to show you, there's nothing underneath, right? This is, just, uh, this is just a mathematics library that I'm using to do this. So I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna uncomment this line and our little friend, the box, will start to bounce around as soon as I can get my mouse over there. All right, All right, so the reason we can do this with only like three lines of code to account for gravity, Hooke's law, and a, a damping function is because the entities that we're using in this context know about both direction and rotation and magnitude all at the same time. So this is actually pretty cool. Now, those of you who do a lot of uh, physics or graphics programming probably think, well, you know, 2D, it's not that big a deal, right? I mean, so what happens if we change this to a three and we come over here and we do it again? Oh, it's, it's a cube now. So you'll note a couple of things here. I didn't change a single line of code other than the dimensionality. That's pretty boss, actually. Normally, you'd have to do a bunch of stuff. Like, if you're a graphics programmer, you can clap. It's OK. Now I'm going to change that. <laughs> but you know, what if we wanted four dimensions? How about a tesseract on a string? Like, that's pretty cool. So I'll post later, I'll post a blog post or something where I go into it line by line what's happening here, but it, it is pretty amazing. And the code, because it's in this nice lispy language, is basically one-to-one -one with the mathematics that we would otherwise use. So, uh-oh, I can't get back to my notes. <laughs> I'm trapped in live coding forever. Let's see. Which I guess isn't the worst thing we could have. There we go, all right. So, all right. So 
hopefully this tiny taste has been enough to attract your interest. We're pretty much out of time, but before you go, I need to mention David Estenis. That's this joyful looking man here. In the 1960s, he started work on a research program aimed at refactoring the notation used for technical mathematics using geometric algebra. And my first exposure to these ideas was in an 80s paper of his that used geometric algebra to explore the Zitterbewegung as a lens on understanding Dirac theory of electrons. It was mind blowing. It blew my mind. And after, <laughs> after spending some time with it, I came to agree with this quote from David Estenius, right? So this is a way that we, we can just move everything into a single formalism and simplify everything that we're doing. This is a chance we have to refactor things in a way that could reduce by maybe two or three years the time it takes to educate a young physicist. And in so doing, make more advanced topics accessible to many more people. This would, I believe, result in real progress in the sciences, which is why I care enough to bring this to your attention today. And if this talk inspires you to read only one paper, I would ask you to read David Estenis' 2002 Orsted Medal Lecture in which he makes this case very, very well. And I'll close with this quote from Hastani's old professor, Richard Feynman, and a few thank yous. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Alex Miller for his tireless efforts organizing one of the best technology conferences in the world for all these years. Can we, yeah. And I'd like to thank the organizers of Papers We Love, Zishan, shout out, for, actually, for inviting me. I'd like to thank my friend Hamish Todd for telling me over lunch in Berlin a few years ago that an active community had formed around geometric algebra, thus renewing my hopes for the future. Uh, I'd like to give thanks to my colleagues at Next Journal for tolerating my eccentricities and supporting my work, including the creation of this talk. And lastly, and of course, thanks to all of you for listening.